Next speaker is uh, Brian Wendell from Stanford University, who has a, a long-standing interest in reading and the visual system, and his talk is going to be on the neural circuitry for vision and reading. A little better. Great. Nikos. <laughs> if, if I was a little more like Nikos, I would rush over there and hug him and pick him up. But I'm more of a laid back California person. Okay. If I was even better. Does anybody see the cursor on this? Maybe it's on the wrong screen. Yeah, good. Unbelievable, huh? <laughs> okay. So, uh, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. And can we get the feedback down? Because I, I know we can't see, but you know, hearing also would be particularly <laughs> This is a multimodal conference, so you know, we got to get all the modes together. Okay, uh, here's what I'm going to do. We're going to move quickly together. I'm going to take you through about uh, four different topics here. First, I'm going to tell you what it feels like when you first come into the field of reading and you would like to learn something about, well, what are people thinking about reading? And, and what are the parts of the brain that might be involved? What are the critical behaviors that we might like to understand? A little bit of background on that. Second, uh, I'm, my goal and in this project is to be able to look at a single kid who might show up in my office or in the clinic, and that kid maybe is having trouble reading. And I'd like to do something for that kid to help them, to diagnose something about them or learn something about them. So remember, that's quite different from saying I've got a group of 100 kids here, and I've got 100 kids here, and I'm going to average them. I want to be able to diagnose individual kids. I'm going to tell you about techniques and methods that we've been working on to try to make quantitative measurements in individual children uh, that might be helpful and someday towards the diagnosis of kids who have trouble reading. And the last bit, I'll tell you about both functional and uh, diffusion measurements in the human brain about this topic. And then in the last uh, part of the talk, I'm going to say that, well, if you want to do that, you really need large sets of data that you can reconfigure quickly in different ways and do um, kind of computational things that we're not quite used to doing. And so now let me disclose I am a founder of a company, Flywheel. I will show you about this a little bit later, where we've been building tools to be able to do these things at large scale. And that'll be the outline of the talk. So first about um, the question of reading itself. In the US and Western Europe, you know, as you, as you go to educators conferences in different places, the, the numbers range somewhere between 15 and 17% of kids in the US grow up and have real difficulty in learning to read. And I, I don't have a hard number on this, but it would be my honest guess that if we just did things like give all those kids breakfast, uh, gave them a safe place to live, the numbers might drop in half. But even so, even kids who are in a safe environment, who are well-fed, who are taken care of, there's still a lot of people, multiple percent, two, three, five percent of kids, who, who even though they're trying and, and they're doing the best they can, um, they really uh, can't learn to read. They can't learn to read in the usual way. And uh, this can be very stressful. If you go to the conferences on dyslexia, and you ask that kid, you know, how are your classmates treating you? You know, you hear these very sad stories. Oh, they tell me I'm stupid, I'm feeling bad about myself, the parents are very upset. It's a stressful disease, and it's something, you know, we all, when you see your kids growing up, you, you hate to see, see that happen. And in the world of education, when you ask people, well, what, 
what's, you know, the que question is, what's the cause? What's the functional deficit? And this is a thing, by the way, that I find very problematic. That what's the functional cause? And I think most of you probably for this moment at least will agree, there's not going to be one. It's like saying, what's the functional cause for fever? Well, doctors are beyond that. You get a fever for lots of different reasons, and we're better at diagnosing the causes of fever. And the same thing for reading and dyslexia. Uh, there will be many reasons. But if you go to the education community, there's one particular phenomenon that really got their attention, which is that the kids who have difficulty reading, even before they start to read, they have difficulty manipulating the sounds of speech. So if I said to you something like the word bat, could you take away the b part of it and what's left? And you would say at. And kids who cannot do that easily uh, often have deficits in learning to read. And this is called phonemic awareness. And, uh, and what's shown here in this graph, um, let's see if I can get this pointer up. Yeah. What's shown here in this graph is the correlation between measures of how well you can do this on this axis and how well the kids learn. It's better if I point like this, I think. Is it? Can you, you can see this, right? No? In, okay, better to do this? Okay, so this axis here, uh, measure of phonological awareness, this axis here, how well the kid either now learns to read, and in fact, this can be done displaced in time in a predictive way. Uh, it, it, the correlations are rather high. You, th these are measurements from my lab, but there's 500 papers in the literature that show this, starting back from Bradley and Bryant and so forth, uh, indicated over there. Okay, so, uh, uh, and in fact, this community finds this, identifies this finding as just being incredibly important. You know, to my mind, the discovery and documentation of the importance of phonemic awareness is the single most powerful advance in the science and pedagogy this century. Marilyn Adams, who's an important figure in there. All these quotes are, are, are of that sort. Okay, so that's if you go to the education community. If you go to the neurologists and you call up Samir and say, well, what do you think these neurology guys think about reading? They will tell you about acquired reading loss. Uh, and they'll typically tell you about the case of Monsieur C, who was a person who was well-to-do, a European, did very, very educated, ran a salon and so forth. And one day he woke up and he had had a stroke uh, and he simply, he could do many good things, but he couldn't read. So this is an acquired reading loss. And Desjardins did a beautiful series of measurements over many years, post-mortem of his brain, of Monsieur C's brain. And he uh, could see that there was in fact damage in lots of places, but through the persistent study, he came to the conclusion Nothing to do with phonological awareness, phonemic awareness. He came to the conclusion that there was a particular piece of white matter in the back of the brain, in what we think of as visual cortex. And Desjardin was reasonably educated about visual fields and so forth. And he said, well, okay, uh, this was cut, this piece of white matter in Monsieur C, and that was essential. And this kind of thinking has been the work of uh, uh, Damasio in, in, more, in 20, 30 years ago and others as an, as an important direction. Okay, but in fact, it doesn't stop there. Uh, Damasio, Simos, uh, a fellow named Henderson, uh, others have a hypothesis that the reading problem is transfer of information through the colossum, one side to the other. Um, a number of people uh, consider the magnocellular pathway in the vision, auditory processing, attention, and then most recently, of course, people focus on uh, the ventral occipital temporal lobe in, in a particular region that's commonly called these days the visual word form area as being, as being an important focus. So there's many, many hypotheses about uh, why it is kids can't read, and there's no reason that one of them has to be true and not the others. It can vary amongst the others. So the summary point one is that there are many competing ideas about the biological basis of reading disability. Uh, and as I think we can all agree, different impediments may affect different people. And I think I would like to have people be enthusiastic about working together to try to identify in which kid, which in each kid may have one, two different kinds. Uh, let's try to be systematic to go through it and see which parts are working and which aren't. And what tools do we have for that?
And how big is the problem? Well, the problem's actually, the brain's a big place. The human brain, you know, is 3,000 times the size of the mouse brain. And they haven't got the mouse brain all figured out. So uh, let's, uh, we have a big problem in front of us. So we have to really marshal big resources to get lots of people to work cooperatively to look at the functional activities, the white matter activities, and so forth. And I want to make a little point here that in just laying out these regions here, I did actually, Samir, because of you, put in this pulvinar into extra striate pathways here and so forth, because if I were to start with the classic Fellman and Van Essen uh, map, it would be too restricted. And in fact, that's why earlier today I asked, I posed a question to Lynn Kjorpies. These pathways here, in fact, the connections coming in here are very dense during development and become less dense uh, in, in primate models as the animal grows up. So the idea, because it's a developmental process, it may be the case that the cause of the reading deficit is a failure to train the brain at an early time, but that once you go to the adult stage, the cause may not even be visible. So that's yet another dimension that we have, not only the brain, the white matter, and the gray matter, but we really need to look at different points in time. Okay, so what tools? We have not that many, but enough that I think we could get started. So, um, and again, the criterion that I have is we would use a tool if it could be used on one person, and I could measure your brain, and uh, be able to report back to it compared to the population of typical readers as a whole. So this is a picture of work that you know, many, many people have replicated at this point in time, uh, finding the visual field maps. So this is one kind of thing we can do. There's a right hemisphere, it's been inflated. Uh, it's as if the person's looking at that red dot. Uh, the stimulus is expanding, and that drives the activity from the posterior part of the brain here, which you can hopefully you can see it moving a little bit from here on forward. Okay, so these kinds of maps are, um, have been measured now many, many times in, in dozens and dozens of labs, and they're very solid, and you see them in an individual. And in fact, you can find them in an individual, an experiment that doesn't take more than about 10 minutes. Uh, you can find the other direction by, by spinning, it, uh, spinning a wedge in this, uh, in this other way and get, the, and get the full map. And so we now have a secure technology that we can go and look at the size, uh, the position, the characteristics of these visual field maps. There's about 20 of them that have been securely found in more than two labs. And so these are things that we know about and we can go find them and measure aspects of their properties and, and all there's various review papers there from the past. This is work that was, we slogged through in the early 90s and so forth and a number of groups. Of course, Samir was the leader early on and, and uh, uh, it was, I don't know, who, who should I be mentioning here? Ted Dio, Roger Tutel, there's a whole bunch of people who all worked through, worked through these things. Um, okay, the next thing is once you find these maps, um, you'd like to be able to quantify them. And one of the things you heard earlier today is the ability to measure receptive field properties. Well, a receptive field property measured at a cell, that's fine, but you can do the same thing when you look at a voxel in a functional magnetic resonance imaging scan. It's a very fundamental concept in the visual pathways. So how would we do that? Well, we might take a stimulus like the one shown here. This is work that I started at, oh, about a little more than 10 years ago with Serge Dumoulin, where uh, for, imagine this is t turning around here, and we have a model of what the receptive field might be of a particular voxel in so within some map in somewhere in the human brain. And you might uh, measure a particular response that's shown here as this blue, slightly noisy line. Uh, you could make a little model that said, well, if this goes around like this, when it goes through the receptive field, I would get a response that looks like this, and then I would ask some hard-nosed technical guy like Patrick, how am I doing here, am I fit? And Patrick said, that's a terrible fit. And I said, okay, how about if I move the receptive field over to here? And Patrick said, okay, you're better. He's, he's a polite guy, let me go. But Mobshin would say, that's no good, Wandel. Make it bigger. Okay, so I'd make it bigger. And, and now we have a good fit. Now I have an estimate of the position and the size of the population receptive field. And there's a massive amount of additional computational technology in this area that I could make this quite a complex and long talk, 
uh, and I don't want to take you through that, but that's a, a, another solid approach, quantifying the receptive field properties of individual voxels that uh, we can use and we have used. And, and uh, th they have a lot of properties that make, make them credible. So uh, you can find the receptive field in, in primary visual cortex in human, it's here in Calcrin. Go to lateral surface around where MT or AV5 would be, and uh, they're much, much bigger. You can look at the receptive field properties from fovea to periphery, and as you look in the different maps, uh, just as we saw from the single unit physiology, they have a sim similar structure here, though perhaps not entirely for the same reasons, but there it is. Okay, so I'm interested in reading, and so far I've only been telling you about vision, but we can take words, and we can use words as part of the stimuli that we use to make these measurements, and we can move bars that are across the field like this that are exposing words, and we can measure these same population receptive fields. And in some cases that we'd like to measure, the regions of cortex that we'd like to measure are not really laid out as maps. They're just collections of voxels. So in cases like that, we can still measure for each voxel how big the, the receptive field is, uh, but we can pool all of the voxels together, and there might be you know, one over here, and one over here, and one over here, and so forth, and you'll find a kind of coverage that this region of the brain has, how much of the visual field is represented in that. It may not be represented as a map, but that's the part of the visual field that gets into that region. So we call that the coverage. And this is work I did with Kauru Amano for a number of years developing these, these maps. And obviously, if you look in something like primary visual cortex, the coverage is a hemifield. Okay, that makes you feel like this method might be good. Uh, and these computational methods have been now used as a, in many other fields, and attention, looking at plasticity and so forth, and that's reviewed by John Winnower and me here. Um, we'd like to use them also in the context that I'm about to take you to, in the context of uh, reading. Okay, so how would we do that? Well, in the early maps, we're good to go. We already know how to do V1, V2, V3, measure the, the population receptive fields, assemble things. Uh, if we were to look at something like reading, we first want to localize parts of the brain that are particularly responsive uh, when people are showing uh, our, our reading words. And in the ventral occipital region here, where all, here's where all the maps are, directly adjacent is a number of little areas that you have all heard about, the you know, fusiform face area, the visual word form area, um, so forth. Sometimes they're there in little copies, like there are two or or possibly three little face responsive regions, there's one or two word responsive regions and so forth. So we can go down into these regions. So this is one of the regions where words are, are uh, much more evocative of a response than objects is shown over here is this, this area. Um, and uh, we can go and look at it. And with Andreas Rauschecker, who was an MD, PhD student, uh, working with me, and Yosef's uh, son is now back at UCSF. I, I wish you could see this, but anyway, primary visual cortex, second map, we're looking at the bottom. This is the visual word form area over here. And in fact, uh, if you take a single kid and put him, have him stare over here and put words up uh, right over here, you can actually see the response in V1 and V2, V3, the fourth visual field map, uh, ventral occipital one and two are maps that we've identified over the years, and in the visual word form area, you can actually track the bold activation and see it presented in each one of these maps in single kids, in single experiments. So, so that's uh, uh, of experiments well under an hour. So um, we can now look at that whole region and say, well, how much of the visual field, it's not a map, but how much of the visual field is represented in that visual word form area uh, in that single kid, and you'll see something that looks like this, and that was uh, interesting and surprising to us. Um, in fact, as you know, primary visual cortex sees out to about 80, 90 degrees in the eccentricity, and it's a whole hemifield and so forth, but only a small portion of that signal is actually delivered into the ventral occipital temporal cortex, just a small part from, from the center. So when you ask yourself, why is it that when I'm looking over here and there's big text over here and I can't read it, 
One pretty good reason is that that part of the visual field, although you see it, it's not delivered to the part of your brain that's, that's trained to process words and read. It just doesn't even get there. So the coverage of that region when you're, see, when you're analyzing words is very limited. And you can actually see the numbers here. I, I hope you can see. This is the central five degrees of the visual field. This is 10 degrees of the visual field. We're really, you know, there's whole parts well near the central fovea that just don't even get there. So that's important. Uh, it seems to me, for, um, for understanding this. Here's another thing that surprised us about, about this particular phenomena, and I think bears on the notion that I'm going to take us to of understanding the whole circuit, which is that uh, what I just showed you were the measurements uh, down here in ventral occipital cortex of, uh, uh, of the visual field coverage um, when you're looking at words. If we repeat that same experiment, do the very same experiment, but instead of putting words on the screen and the, as the bar moves across, but we just put texture patterns or some, something else, almost a faces, doesn't really matter what you put, but not words. And then you measure here again, you can see that the part of the visual field that drives the response here, which is very near the center when you have words, uh, becomes much more peripheral. This is about three degrees central over here, and here it's about six or seven degrees over here when you put the other stimulus. So that the stimuli that are actually delivered to this piece of cortex probably differ depending on the, on the pattern that's on the screen itself. And, and you know, those of us used to working with circuits are well aware that when you have a signal here, there can be switches that drive things this way, or the switch turns and it drives it a different way and so forth. So that these would be adaptive circuits that, that process things in a way that depend on what the stimulus itself is. By the way, I'm happy if you take pictures of this, but you should all know that all of these figures are available in the published papers, or I have these slides online. You can download them, use them in your talks, use them in your classes, anything you like, do whatever. Just Try not to be rude about them, but use them as you like. Okay, so let me skip this one. Okay, so then again, I keep emphasizing that it's important to us to be able to do this in individual subjects, one person at a time. And uh, we can do this and have done this now in, I don't know, about 40, this is 20 of the 40 individual kids uh, that we can measure. And uh, one of the things you can see is that the extent of the coverage, say, between this, this subject and this subject is quite different. And some have a more angular and so forth, and, and these aren't noise. We, we uh, on a kid, will usually measure two, three, four times, depending on the kid. And we have sense of error bars of these coverage, and they're within about a, you know, a fraction of a degree. They're pretty, they're pretty solid. So, uh, but they're very different. And one of the things we are now interested to explore is whether these differences relate, all these subjects here are good readers. So I don't have poor readers with this, but one of the things we will explore is poor readers in this regard. And when, uh, one of the things you might imagine is that this alone may not be a problem if the eye movement pattern that the kid has is more extensive. Whereas if the, this one here, this, this kid's VWFA or ventral reading regions receive a lot of the visual field, he may not need to move his eye quite as much. Whereas this guy may have to move a lot more. And it may be the case that there's nothing wrong exactly with either system, but there's a compliance difference. Maybe if you're too small and your eye movements are a little not quite that good, maybe then you have a problem. So we have to look at the thing as a whole system. And my colleague, Colony grill Specter and Jesse Gomez have started to look at this sort of thing in some papers I think came out a year or two ago and uh, uh, looking at the relationship between these coverage maps and eye movement patterns. But they didn't use words in reading. They just used checkerboard patterns. So it's not immediately relevant to this. Uh, the other thing some of you might ask is whether these effects start to happen somewhere before the reading circuitry, and in fact, that's true. The stimulus dependence of the uh, visual field of these population receptive fields can, you don't really see much in V1 or V2, but they really do start to shift. So this axis here shows 
how far out the eccentricity when you're showing words, and this axis shows the eccentricity when you're showing checkerboards in these moving patterns and, and to measure the receptive field. And you can see that they're not on the identity line by the time you get to V3 and V4 and these ventral occipital maps. So in fact, this stimulus, adaptive stimulus response is present before you get to the reading circuitry. It doesn't happen only at the time that you get to the reading circuitry. Uh, it's also true in other parts of the brain. Um, uh, Laurent Cohen, Stan Hans' uh, close associate, uh, made the observation that up here in these parietal regions, you can also get um, reading responses. And when we looked at our, using our methods, at the nature of the responses here, we could see the same kinds of things. Where if you put words in here, this is very central. When you put checkerboards in, it's more, much more peripheral. So the next generation, and what I am urging the students who are working with me, or at least used to work with me, and now are young professors, but I'm urging them when they get a call from me, the call is about developing circuit models so that we can predict the relationship between these different these signals in the different parts of the brain and how the connections between them are maintained and starting to think about this as a circuit response. And that's, um, that's where we are. And so the, this summary I'd like to say here is that portions of the visual circuitry for seeing words uh, can be identified and certain functional responses can be reliably estimated in single subjects and uh, we don't know at this point, but we're hopeful that these will end up being part of how we diagnose uh, the, the diagnosis of um, individual kids. Let me say uh, for a few minutes then, um, as we were doing this, and when Nikos and I were young, uh, not that long ago, I, I, it's within memory, uh, when the uh, notion that you would look at the white matter of the brain really was not, not taken seriously. You'd open up Candell's book or something, and uh, gee, white matter, that was just a set of rigid wires, glia, not important. A lot of stuff wasn't important, because when, when you don't know stuff about it, you don't think it's important. Okay, so that was very convenient. Um, but over the years, and I really want to credit uh, the development of the magnetic resonance imaging approaches to studying the human brain, the importance of white matter um, has risen. People recognize that it's important. And once I remember chatting with Nikos about this in that usual explosive way that he has, he looks at me and says, but of course, of course, it's important. It's, and, and it's not just a wire, it's biology, it's alive. And I always think of that when I get to this point in the lecture, that the white matter, yeah, it's alive. And the idea that it would just sit there while the rest of your brain is learning and changing and so forth, but the white matter, oh, no, no, I'm just a wire. I don't actually do anything. That seems to me like the unlikely position. The likely position is that the white matter responses, responds, and so we should be able to study it. And diffusion magnetic resonance imaging has provided one very good approach to identifying pathways through the white matter. And there are various related approaches, the diffusion measure itself, but also quantitative measurements of MRI, I'll mention a little bit more later, for measuring the white matter, give you opportunities to learn things about these pathways that I think will be important. Um, my group has developed a series of, I, that, that field is bubbling, there's just a lot going on, and when fields develop like this, as, as, they, as was true in the early days of fMRI, people are yelling at one another and saying, this is no good and that's no good, but it's a very good field. It'll become really solid over the next 10, 20 years for sure, just as fMRI settled into something plausible. Uh, th this will be also, and there are a set of tools about finding the tract, identifying the tracts, labeling them in individual subjects, which again makes it a good target for what I would I'd like to do, and for quantifying them uh, and making measurements. So let me give you a sense why for reading this would matter. I already mentioned to you at the beginning that Desjardins said, you know, yeah, uh, the white matter, that seems to be essential for the loss from Monsieur C, why, why it is he acquired uh, a reading loss. But you know, from the earliest days of making uh, diffusion measurements, these are some early measurements with uh, Bob Doherty from my lab, uh, we started segmenting out the corpus callosum of individuals and finding parts in the corpus callosum, uh, in particular the part uh, 
in the corpus callosum that connects the two temporal lobes. And if you measure the diffusion in the corpus callosum between the two parts, two hemispheres that uh, connect the temporal lobe, you get one of these, these kind of, for me at the time, it was an amazing graph, where on this axis we're measuring the, diffuse, the radial diffusivity, this is how water is flowing perpendicular to the callosum. And this is reading. So you take a kid, have them read, and you measure how quickly they can read. You, and then you stick them in a scanner, and you measure how water diffuses here, and you can get these uh, correlations that are, you know, enough, uh, they're good enough to publish, but they're not good enough for a diagnosis. And w the reason I say that is, if somebody comes in with a measure like this, and you say, well, what reading score will you have? Well, it could be anywhere. Uh, if you say, well, what's the R value? You say, well, that's, you know, well, highly significant and so forth, it was fine, it's fine for a scientist, but not good enough for a clinician or for, for practical use. I should mention also Michal ben Shahar has been a great collaborator on um, all this. Uh, we followed this up developmentally uh, in some studies with Jason Yateman over the years, and we looked at, uh, at how the, the uh, basically a measure of diffusion changes over uh, four measurements over three years. And in some kids, the diffusivity on one of these main tracks, now I'm looking at a different track called the inferior longitudinal fasciculus. For some kids, the, uh, the fractional anisotropy increases, and for some it goes down. And in fact, it turns out that if you're a poor reader, you're likely to go down, and if you're a good reader, you're likely to go up. And we don't have the causality on that, but we have the correlation. Uh, again, this can get you one of these uh, publishable correlations, but n again, not good enough. Uh, if you know whether the kid's going up, the reading score could still be a, over a whole range over here. So it's a correlation, but um, you know, hasn't yet reached to the level that we want. So again, we now have functional responses, and we've got wires, uh, the living wires connecting these different regions that are, that are growing and connecting the two hemispheres. And here I'm showing the arcuate and uh, and another one that actually we discovered or rediscovered after it having been ignored for about 50 years, the vertical occipital fasciculus. And uh, I think building models of how these all work together is a good, important part of the, what, we hope, what we hope to accomplish. So for this summary, I'd like to say that um, certain anatomical properties, including tract diffusivity, so finding the tracts we can do, Measuring diffusivity, both radial and axial, and the ratios of these are things that we can do, and we can do them with some precision, the quantitative measurements uh, in individual kids. And uh, these might, again, be helpful in diagnosing the parts of the circuit that we think are failing if you have a particular individual kid who's um, not doing well in reading. And our summaries of this are indicated in these papers and, and some subsequent ones that, that I will point, uh, that, are, that are referenced in these slides earlier. Okay, oh, uh, yes, I remember why. I'm, I'm hesitating because there's one more thing I wanted to say. Um, maybe not known to most of you, but uh, the field I, I am most passionate about recently in these MRI measurements is the ability to make quantitative measurements of the physical signals in MR, the T1 maps they're called. So many of you have heard of T1 images. T1-weighted. T1-weighted means we didn't quite calibrate it, but it's mostly kind of T1-ish. A T1 map means we really get a number with a second. And uh, our group and a, quite a number of groups in the MR community have been trying to relate those quantitative physical measurements of these signals to um, biological substrate like, and they answer a question, are there more neurons here or glia? Is there more myelin here? or just mem or membranes with little myelin. And the ability to make quantified measurements of the MR signal uh, that we then build models of to take us to the biological substrate is not something I'm spending any time on, but it is something I look at the students, and there are many of you up there. I think that's a really important future direction. I would point you to recent papers by Aviv uh, Mezer, M-E-Z-E-R, uh, who just had a nice pace uh, using these techniques in um, nature, and I, and I, I think it's um, an important direction. Okay, last bit then.
So many of you will have mostly been exposed to these po very popular and, and widespread uses of a, a functional MRI where you'll see maps like this and people point you at the reds and the blues and, and say stuff. And these will have been generated by take a group of people over here and take a group of people over there and average the two groups and put the differences and lay them on the brain like this. And that has driven, I think, the philosophy and the approach of a lot of cognitive neuroscience. But remember, that's not my goal. I, I don't want a kid to come to my office and say, well, wait a minute, you can't read. Let me get another 99 kids who can't read, and I'll put you in that group, and I'll average you all together, and then I'll take these, and I'll average them together, and we'll see how that all works out. That's not my goal. So we need tools uh, that would let us do this, where I could collect up all, say, the typically developing reader, and maybe a kid shows up in my office with some measurement, could be a PRF size, could be a diffusion measurement, could be almost anything, and say, you know, this kid's over here, and you know, what I've learned is that when kids are over here, if we just stick with it, with the remedial reading, they're gonna learn to read. Maybe it'll be six months later, maybe a year later, but it's gonna be okay. But you know, if the kid ends up over here, and I, I call the parents and say, you know, the kids who've looked like this, never really learn to read, and we really got to get them uh, audio books, and we've got to get them supplementary ways to, get, to do well in school. And give the parents information, you know, early, as early as possible in the process. Um, and, and just to make, drive this point home, if you don't do that, if you do groups, you know, I can have two measures like this, where here were the, the blue were the typically developing readers. These might be the kids who are not such good readers, and I could take, you, take this into the group average, and it would look like the group average is here, these are the standard errors of the mean, it looked like I had some big effect and I could go get it published. Doesn't do me any good. Okay, I don't wanna do that. I wanna do the other thing. So, I, as I disclosed to you earlier, and I repeat here, uh, I need a way to get a lot of data from a lot of sources and be able to configure it and, and pull together a group this way and a group that way, because maybe it's a boy from Germany and, uh, and I'd like a control group of other kids who are 10 years old from Germany and pull them together. Or maybe it's a girl from Alabama and I need a bunch of girls from the South who've done whatever they do down there in the South. Okay, so um, we built Flywheel, and uh, I have to say the main, st I, the, the, the company's going fine, and we're collecting actually at this point several millions of data sets across all different types in different, in different ways. So, uh, you know, it's, things are going, going forward, but not, most nothing to do with reading at this point, but I'm ready if anybody, you know, wants to work with us on this. And uh, the number one lesson we learned is um, if I try to put these tools into the hands of individual labs, where's Mavshin? There's Mavshin. Uh, Mavshin uses the phrase, um, co we're a cottage industry. And I like that phrase. Um, and that we kind of, you know, it's your lab, and it's your lab, and it's your lab, and so forth. And that we live in a cottage industry. And the way we set up our MR centers originally reflected this cottage industry that, that Tony points, points us to. And that means stuff came out of the scanner and it goes to one lab, goes to the next lab, goes to the next lab. And at that point, I have to say that what I felt as a director of an MR center, the data were in the wind, they were lost. Uh, and so what Flywheel and what we do at our centers now across Stanford is when the data come out of the scanners, they immediately go into the database. It's just that one move, just do that. Put the data into the database before you send it out to everybody. And then people still get their data, but you've got them all databased. And when you do that, you can give them lots of tools and their visualizations and standard methods of processing and things at the center that makes them happy. But the data are still there. They're not lost and they're sh they remain shareable. And I won't take you through all the things that we do, but there's a lot of stuff like that. And so the idea, I believe, I hope, is that as we go forward with the you know, former students and postdocs and young faculty who are collecting things, we will be able to keep data in these databases that we can configure together and share. We'll develop quantitative methods that apply to individual subjects and we'll build up the tools so that we'll be able to help some kid who shows up in some clinician's office by having him do a few simple measures and say, you know, you're this type of poor reader or you're that type of poor reader and uh, do those diagnoses. Uh, so thank you for your attention. I covered the topics here. And uh, as everybody, I, you know, I tried to mention people during the talk, 
but uh, it's been a, a real lucky time at Stanford to have all these different students and postdocs uh, to work with, and thank you for your attention. Well, questions? Can you, can you hand this over? Oh, sorry. Does it work? It has a little lag, and then it seems to work. Try it again. Try speaking. Oh, it does work? No. Try this one. It does work, yes. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful, inspiring talk. I have a terminological issue. Um, you, uh, when discussing these, these children, you were talking about a stressful disease, about a functional deficit. We saw um, pictures with the word patience in it and so on. Could I compare this to a similar case to make my point? In the Netherlands, all kids have to learn to drive a bike. And they start when they are three or four years old. And, and, and the parents work on this. And they all learn it. They all learn it, which is critical in our culture. Except for two or three percent. These children, therefore, have a disease, a stressful disease. It's called dyscyclia. <laughs> and now you feel what I am getting to. These are cultural problems and we should not label cultural problems neurological problems. Reading was not we were not evolved for being able to read. It is only since about 100 years that most humans can read at least somewhat. So now this late development makes it indeed critical in many cultures that you can read and, and you're hampered if you cannot. But it is not a neurological disease. They have different brains than other people. But for evolution, it has been totally irrelevant. For evolution, it has been totally irrelevant whether or not you have phonological awareness. Totally irrelevant. You can speak. Okay. So I, let me say, I, I have no disagreement. Uh, I, if at any moment, I, I'm not sure what Pim was picking up on, but if at any moment during this talk I indicated any disrespect to any child because they couldn't read, I surely had no intention of, of doing that. And, and some kids can, just don't learn to read, and I'd like to help them. And I would say I've devoted a fair number of my waking hours to trying to help them. And uh, I completely agree with you. There are, you know, one of the people who... Um, uh, helped me get started in the field was Charles Schwab, who is enormously successful. He's a banker in the United States, and he can't read worth a damn. And uh, I, uh, you know, so th uh, some kids can't ride bicycles, some kids can't read. We need to help them. And I completely agree with your point. You know, I ask for eye movement measurements. Burkhard Fischer in Freiburg has collected 10,000 of such measurements all over Germany, and you may want to contact his Blick Labor and see whether they are useful to you. you. The second comment is, isn't it true that people who cannot read well sometimes cannot speak well or write well and have problems in mathematics? So it appears to be a multifactorial problem. Well, uh, the first one, just thank you. And the second part, um, there are no um, studies that you and I would, so this is Lothar Spielmann, that, that uh, Lothar and I would look at and say, there's a tight connection between an inability 
to, and I, I by the way, uh, uh, this is for you in particular, to see words, I usually say, rather than reading, because reading is deeper. That there's a tight ability between seeing words, learning to see words, and um, motor acts, or speech acts, or other things. The tightest one is photological awareness, but these others which have been examined again and again in the literature, my best reading of it, is that, yeah, it happens sometimes. Sometimes you get a small statistical effect from a small sample, but there's no powerful, uh, dr you know, driving, tight relationship between uh, these other phenomena, which you hear about. You also hear, uh, by the way, if you go to uh, the Dyslexia Association with me, the parents almost invariably tell you the opposite, that it's a special gift. Uh, the kids are more creative. The kids are better in some particular way. And I always respond to them at that point, say, isn't that great? I'm glad you feel that way, because the kids, the kids need the support, so. Um, in the um, electroencephalography field, there, there was a lot of interest in trying to use the EEG, the quantitative EEG for the diagnosis. Uh, it started by Edward Roy Young in the, in, in the 60s, and the field was called neurometrics. No? In some sense, it's similar to the idea that you are, plan to what you are planning for uh, for dyslexia in particular. I, I think one of the reasons why it didn't work it completely, it was because the EU was very sensitive to, to problems, but maybe not so specific. I don't know if you expect to have this sort of problems when applying these ideas to uh, MRI. Uh, you know, by the way, there's uh, excellent work out of Switzerland from Sylvia Brem who uses EEG expensively to diagnose and to check the development. Uh, and I didn't mention her, but it's, uh, that field continues in a really good way. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I didn't present, you all have noticed, and feel free to gossip about this later, that I did not present to you a single compelling case that, that we had yet discovered uh, the right way to segment kids and to use these methods. All I did was saying, you know, my review articles are reviews that are saying, we're getting geared up. Anybody want to get on board with us and try to do, do a larger systematic study for this? So there have been many failures along the way, and um, we haven't yet had, had the success I would like to, but I take your point. Brian, that was awesome. Oh, Patrick thank you. Oh, hey, Patrick. Yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I had a, a, a small question you probably thought about. When you were talking about the coverage of the different uh, areas, you were saying that some high-level areas, it may be the visual word form area as well, uh, in particular voxel, would respond to a word at a closer, smaller eccentricity than it would to um, texture pattern. And I wonder if that would have uh, implications for how you would see that word. Would it look bigger and closer to the fovea? Uh, and could that be a cheap way to do the... the uh... we, we, we also have done things like change the sizes of the fonts to see, which has also effects on shifting things. Uh, I, I don't have a positional correlate for you. It's very, as usual, if Patrick had a creative experiment and thing for me to, for me to check. We, we haven't tried that. I, I, I would say, let's, you know, Patrick has led me around on little tours, just looking at things carefully, and I'll go back and look at that a little bit for... Dinner no, dinner tonight. <laughs> You mentioned um, the problem instead of reading the word, spelling out single letters. I've come across a child like that, and um, when I asked him to repeat the word after he has lettered it out, he was able to do so. And it helped him in a very short time to become a good reader, or recent reader. Um, do you have any idea what the problem, the primary problem in these kids is? No, but if we had more, no, no specific case. And, um, but I, I would say I want to use your comment to expand on the notion. You, some of you will have heard the phrase letter by letter reading. And this is usually the diagnosis of somebody who has particularly acquired, uh, you know, used to be a good reader and then all of a sudden they can't do it and they have to go letter by letter and then infer the word. And uh, usually that's a sign of a problem, not a problem that by training that, that it can be solved. So your, in, your example sound, sounds interesting, but I, I, I get many uh, case examples. You know, there's uh, people who have told me with great confidence that if they put some, some kids, they have them look through colored filters. 
and what color could be blue, could be red, could be yellow, that that will cause the kid to see better. And they'll, then they'll tell me about the magnocellular hypothesis. But there are many, many cases where kids do recover in some ways that we don't understand. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I don't have anything deep about your case other than to build on it. Thomas Hadmüller, I was interested in these relatively narrow coverage fields that you show for the word processing areas. I wonder, were these measured with words? And if you would take other simple stimuli, would they look different? And if so, does it depend on prior knowledge about the language that you actually use? So let me say thanks for noticing that. Um, yes, it is a main point, really, when we put words in, in the, to measure. Uh, they are more, they're more towards the fovea. When we put other s things, many other things, but texture patterns, for example, they're more towards the periphery. So it really does, in the, in the word regions, it's the biggest effect in the word regions. You can see it in others, but that's the biggest one. And um, you, you had a last point, but I've... Yeah. So if you used, like, fake words or words in an uh, unknown language... We ran Hebrew kids, uh, Israeli kids who, uh, we, it's hard to find an Israeli kid who doesn't uh, read some English, but we found the ones who knew English as little as possible, and there was almost no difference in their responses between Hebrew and English. But that's not, you know, we, we're in uh, Asia a lot these days, and I'm hoping that these things will uh, be tried on uh, people's, you know, Japanese, uh, Chinese uh, readers and so forth. It's quite different. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, neuroscientists and educators will be very interested in your research. My simple question is, uh, you are working with the kids that are otherwise healthy, right? Not after TBIs or autistic kids. That's true. Okay, because in autistic kids, we know that different fonts will um, evoke different interests, right? So autistic kids can read some fonts and they cannot see even or identify other fonts. So were you interested in trying different fonts also in healthy kids? Uh, well, we did. Not, not so much fonts, but word sizes, you know, font sizes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there are changes there. I, I don't know much about this phenomenon. It sounds interesting. I'll try to look it up. You say that in autistic kids, the nature of the font matters. Yes, they cannot even. I, I just, I'm, I'm doing this research on, mm. on autistic kids. So, yeah, it struck me like it was really very interesting. But yes. thank you very much. Fascinating talk. Thank you. Yeah, I can only join that. Thank you all for the spirited discussion.